The Discourses of Epictetus Translated by George Long Book 2 Chapter 21 Of Inconsistency Some things men readily confess, and other things they do not. No one then will confess that he is a fool or without understanding, but quite the contrary you will hear all men saying, I wish that I had fortune equal to my understanding. But men readily confess that they are timid, and they say, I am rather timid, I confess, but as to other respects, you will not find me to be foolish. A man will not readily confess that he is intemperate, and that he is unjust, he will not confess at all. He will by no means confess that he is envious or a busybody. Most men will confess that they are compassionate. What then is the reason? The chief thing, the ruling thing, is inconsistency and confusion in the things which relate to good and evil. But different men have different reasons, and generally what they imagine to be base, they do not confess at all. But they suppose timidity to be a characteristic of a good disposition, and compassion also, but silliness to be the absolute characteristic of a slave. And they do not at all admit, confess, the things which are offenses against society. But in the case of most errors for this reason chiefly they are induced to confess them, because they imagine that there is something involuntary in them as in timidity and compassion. And if a man confess that he is in any respect intemperate, he alleges love, or passion, as an excuse for what is involuntary. But men do not imagine injustice to be at all involuntary. There is also in jealousy, as they suppose, something involuntary, and for this reason they confess to jealousy also. Living then among such men, who are so confused, so ignorant of what they say, and of the evils which they have or have not, and why they have them, or how they shall be relieved of them, I think it is worth the trouble for a man to watch constantly. And to ask, whether I also am one of them, what imagination I have about myself, how I conduct myself, whether I conduct myself as a prudent man, whether I conduct myself as a temperate man, whether I ever say this, that I have been taught to be prepared for everything that may happen. Have I the consciousness which a man who knows nothing ought to have, that I know nothing? Do I go to my teacher as men go to oracles, prepared to obey? Or do I like a sniveling boy go to my school to learn history and understand the books which I did not understand before, and, if it should happen so, to explain them also to others? Man, you have had a fight in the house with a poor slave, you have turned the family upside down, you have frightened the neighbors, and you come to me, as if you were a wise man, and you take your seat and judge how I have explained some word, and how I have babbled whatever came into my head. You come full of envy, and humbled, because you bring nothing from home, and you sit during the discussion thinking of nothing else than how your father is disposed towards you and your brother. What are they saying about me there? Now they think that I am improving, and are saying, he will return with all knowledge. I wish I could learn everything before I return, but much labor is necessary, and no one sends me anything, and the baths at Nicopolis are dirty, everything is bad at home, and bad here. Then they say, no one gains any profit from the school. Why, who comes to the school? Who comes for the purpose of being improved? Who comes to present his opinions to be purified? Who comes to learn what he is in want of? Why do you wonder then if you carry back from the school the very things which you bring into it? For you, you come not to lay aside your principles, or to correct them or to receive other principles in place of them. By no means, nor anything like it. 
You rather look to this, whether you possess already that for which you come. You wish to prattle about theorems? What then? Do you not become greater triflers? Do not your little theorems give you some opportunity of display? You solve sophistical syllogisms. Do you not examine the assumptions of the syllogism named the liar? Do you not examine hypothetical syllogisms? Why then are you still vexed if you receive the things for which you come to the school? Yes, but if my child die or my brother, or if I must die or be racked, what good will these things do me? Well, did you come for this? For this, do you sit by my side? Did you ever for this light your lamp or keep awake? Or, when you went out to the walking place, did you ever propose any appearance that had been presented to you instead of a syllogism, and did you and your friends discuss it together? Where and when? Then you say, theorems are useless. To whom? To such as make a bad use of them. For I selves are not useless to those who use them as they ought and when they ought. Fomentations are not useless. Dumbbells are not useless, but they are useless to some, useful to others. If you ask me now if syllogisms are useful, I will tell you that they are useful, and if you choose, I will prove it a dash how then will they in any way be useful to me? Man, did you ask if they are useful to you? Or did you ask generally? Let him who is suffering from dysentery ask me if vinegar is useful, I will say that it is useful, dash will it then be useful to me? I will say, no. Seek first for the discharge to be stopped and the ulcers to be closed. And do you, O oh men, first cure the ulcers and stop the discharge, be tranquil in your mind, bring it free from distraction into the school, and you will know what power reason has. Book 2 Chapter 22 On Friendship A man applies himself to earnestly that he naturally loves. Do men then apply themselves earnestly to the things which are bad? By no means. Well, do they apply themselves to things which in no way concern themselves? Not to these either. It remains then that they employ themselves earnestly only about things which are good, and if they are earnestly employed about things, they love such things also. Whoever then understands what is good, can also know how to love, but he who cannot distinguish good from bad, and things which are neither good nor bad from both, how can he possess the power of loving? To love, then, is only in the power of the wise. How is this? A man may say, I am foolish, and yet I love my child. I am surprised indeed that you have begun by making the admission that you are foolish. For what are you deficient in? Can you not make use of your senses? Do you not distinguish appearances? Do you not use food which is suitable for your body and clothing and habitation? Why then do you admit that you are foolish? It is in truth, because you are often disturbed by appearances and perplexed, and their power of persuasion often conquers you. And sometimes you think these things to be good, and then the same things to be bad, and lastly neither good nor bad, and in short you grieve, fear, envy, are disturbed, you are changed. This is the reason why you confess that you are foolish. And are you not changeable in love? But wealth, and pleasure, and in a word things themselves, do you sometimes think them to be good, and sometimes bad? And do you not think the same men at one time to be good, at another time bad? And have you not at one time a friendly feeling towards them, and at another time the feeling of an enemy? 
And do you not at one time praise them, and at another time, blame them? Yes, I have these feelings, also. Well then, do you think that he who has been deceived about a man is his friend? Certainly not. And he who has selected a man as his friend, and is of a changeable disposition, has he goodwill towards him? He has not. And he who now abuses a man, and afterwards admires him? This man also has no good will to the other. Well then, did you never see little dogs caressing and playing with one another, so that you might say, there is nothing more friendly? But that you may know what friendship is, throw a bit of flesh among them, and you will learn. Throw between yourself and your son a little estate, and you will know how soon he will wish to bury you, and how soon you wish your son to die. Then you will change your tone and say, What a son I have brought up. He has long been wishing to bury me. Throw a smart girl between you, and do you the old man love her, and the young one will love her too. If a little fame intervene or dangers, it will be just the same. You will utter the words of the father of Admetus. Life gives you pleasure, and why not your father? Do you think that Admetus did not love his own child when he was little? That he was not in agony when the child had a fever? That he did not often say, I wish I had the fever instead of the child, then when the test, the thing, came and was near, see what words they utter. Were not Ediocles and Polynices from the same mother and from the same father? Were they not brought up together, had they not lived together, drunk together, slept together, and often kissed one another? So that if any man, I think, had seen them, he would have ridiculed the philosophers for the paradoxes which they utter about friendship. But when a quarrel rose between them about the royal power, as between dogs about a bit of meat, see what they say. Polynices, where will you take your station, before the towers? Ediocles, why do you ask me this? Polynices, I will place myself opposite and try to kill you. Ediocles, I also wish to do the same. Such are the wishes that they utter. For universally, be not deceived, every animal is attached to nothing so much as to its own interest. Whatever then appears to it an impediment to this interest, whether this be a brother, or a father, or a child, or beloved, or lover, it hates, spurns, curses, for its nature is to love nothing so much as its own interest. This is father, and brother, and kinsman, and country, and God. When then the gods appear to us to be an impediment to this, we abuse them and throw down their statues and burn their temples, as Alexander ordered the temples of Aesculapius to be burned when his dear friend died. For this reason if a man put in the same place his interest, sanctity, goodness, and country, and parents, and friends, all these are secured, but if he puts in one place his interest, in another his friends, and his country and his kinsmen and justice itself, all these give way being borne down by the weight of interest. For where the eye and the mind are placed, to that place of necessity the animal inclines, if in the flesh, there is the ruling power if in the will, it is there, and if it is in externals, it is there. If then I am there where my will is, then only shall I be a friend. Such as I ought to be, and son, and father, for this will be my interest, to maintain the character of fidelity, of modesty, of patience, of abstinence, of active cooperation, of observing my relations, towards all. But if I put myself in one place, and honesty in another, then the doctrine of Epicurus becomes strong, which asserts either that there is no honesty or it is that which opinion holds to be honest, 
Virtuous. It was through this ignorance that the Athenians and the Lacedaemonians quarreled, and the Thebans with both, and the great king quarreled with Hellas, and the Macedonians with both, and the Romans with the Getty. And still earlier the Trojan War happened for these reasons. Alexander was the guest of Menelaus, and if any man had seen their friendly disposition, he would not have believed anyone who said that they were not friends. But there was cast between them, as between dogs, a bit of meat, a handsome woman, and about her war arose. And now when you see brothers to be friends appearing to have one mind, do not conclude from this anything about their friendship, not even if they swear it and say that it is impossible for them to be separated from one another. For the ruling principle of a bad man cannot be trusted, it is insecure, has no certain rule by which it is directed, and is overpowered at different times by different appearances. But examine, not what other men examine, if they are born of the same parents and brought up together, and under the same pedagogue, but examine this only, wherein they place their interest, whether in externals or in the will. If in externals, do not name them friends, no more than name them trustworthy or constant, or brave or free, do not name them even men, if you have any judgment. For that is not a principle of human nature which makes them bite one another, and abuse one another, and occupy deserted places or public places, as if they were mountains, and in the courts of justice display the acts of robbers, nor yet that which makes them intemperate and adulterers and corruptors, nor that which makes them do whatever else men do against one another through this one opinion only, that of placing themselves and their interests in the things which are not within the power of their will. But if you hear that in truth, these men think the good to be only there, where will is, and where there is a right use of appearances, no longer trouble yourself whether they are father or son, or brothers, or have associated a long time and are companions, but when you have ascertained this only, confidently declare that they are friends, as you declare that they are faithful, that they are just. For where else is friendship than where there is fidelity, and modesty, where there is a communion of honest things and of nothing else? But you may say, such a one treated me with regard so long, and did he not love me? How do you know, slave, if he did not regard you in the same way as he wipes his shoes with a sponge, or as he takes care of his beast? How do you know, when you have ceased to be useful as a vessel, he will not throw you away like a broken platter? But this woman is my wife, and we have lived together so long. And how long did Eraphile live with Amphiaros, and was the mother of children and of many? But a necklace came between them. And what is a necklace? It is the opinion about such things. That was the bestial principle, that was the thing which broke asunder the friendship between husband and wife, that which did not allow the woman to be a wife, nor the mother to be a mother. And let every man among you who has seriously resolved either to be a friend himself or to have another for his friend, cut out these opinions, hate them, drive them from his soul. And thus first of all, he will not reproach himself, he will not be at variance with himself, he will not change his mind, he will not torture himself. In the next place, to another also, who is like himself, he will be altogether and completely a friend. But he will bear with the man who is unlike himself, he will be kind to him, gentle, ready to pardon on account of his ignorance, on account of his being mistaken in things of the greatest importance. But he will be harsh to no man, being well convinced of Plato's doctrine that every mind is deprived of truth unwillingly. If you cannot do this, yet you can do in all other respects as friends do, drink together, and lodge together, and sail together, and you may be born of the same parents, for snakes also are, but neither will they be friends nor you. So long as you retain these bestial and cursed opinions.
Book 2 Chapter 23 On the Power of Speaking Every man will read a book with more pleasure, or even with more ease, if it is written in fairer characters. Therefore every man will also listen more readily to what is spoken, if it is signified by appropriate and becoming words. We must not say then that there is no faculty of expression, for this affirmation is the characteristic of an impious and also of a timid man. Of an impious man, because he undervalues the gifts which come from God, just as if he would take away the commodity of the power of vision, or of hearing, or of seeing. Has then God given you eyes to no purpose? And to no purpose has he infused into them a spirit so strong and of such skillful contrivance as to reach a long way and to fashion the forms of things which are seen. What messenger is so swift and vigilant? And to no purpose has he made the interjacent atmosphere so efficacious and elastic that the vision penetrates through the atmosphere which is in a manner moved. And to no purpose has he made light without the presence of which there would be no use in any other thing? Man, be neither ungrateful for these gifts nor yet forget the things which are superior to them. But indeed for the power of seeing and hearing, and indeed for life itself, and for the things which contribute to support it, for the fruits which are dry, and for wine and oil give thanks to God. But remember that he has given you something else better than all these, I mean the power of using them, proving them and estimating the value of each. For what is that which gives information about each of these powers, what each of them is worth? Is it each faculty itself? Did you ever hear the faculty of vision saying anything about itself? Or the faculty of hearing? Or wheat? or barley, or a horse, or a dog. No, but they are appointed as ministers and slaves to serve the faculty which has the power of making use of the appearances of things. And if you inquire what is the value of each thing, of whom do you inquire? Who answers you? How then can any other faculty be more powerful than this? which uses the rest as ministers and itself proves each and pronounces about them. For which of them knows what itself is, and what is its own value? Which of them knows when it ought to employ itself and when not? What faculty is it which opens and closes the eyes, and turns them away from objects to which it ought not to apply them and does apply them to other objects? Is it the faculty of vision? No, but it is the faculty of the will. What is that faculty which closes and opens the ears? What is that by which they are curious and inquisitive, or on the contrary, unmoved by what is said? Is it the faculty of hearing? It is no other than the faculty of the will. Will this faculty then, seeing that it is amidst all the other faculties, which are blind and dumb and unable to see anything else except the very acts for which they are appointed in order to minister to this faculty and serve it, but this faculty alone sees sharp and sees what is the value of each of the rest, will this faculty declare to us that anything else is the best? Or that itself is? And what else does the eye do when it is open than see? But whether we ought to look on the wife of a certain person, and in what manner, who tells us? The faculty of the will. And whether we ought to believe what is said or not to believe it, and if we do believe, whether we ought to be moved by it or not, who tells us? Is it not the faculty of the will? But this faculty of speaking and of ornamenting words, if there is indeed any such peculiar faculty, what else does it do, when there happens to be discourse about a thing? than to ornament the words and arrange them as hairdressers do the hair. But whether it is better to speak or to be silent, and better to speak in this way or that way, and whether this is becoming or not becoming, and the season for each and the use, what else tells us than the faculty of the will? 
Would you have it then to come forward and condemn itself? What then? It, the will, says, if the fact is so, can that which ministers be superior to that to which it ministers, can the horse be superior to the rider, or the dog to the huntsman, or the instrument to the musician, or the servants to the king? What is that which makes use of the rest? The will. What takes care of all? The will. What destroys the whole man, at one time by hunger, at another time by hanging, and at another time by a precipice? The will. Then is anything stronger in men than this? And how is it possible that the things which are subject to restraint are stronger than that which is not? What things are naturally formed to hinder the faculty of vision? Both will and things which do not depend on the faculty of the will. It is the same with the faculty of hearing, with the faculty of speaking in like manner. But what has a natural power of hindering the will? Nothing which is independent of the will, but only the will itself, when it is perverted. Therefore this, the will, is alone vice or alone virtue. Then being so great a faculty and set over all the rest, let it, the will, come forward and tell us that the most excellent of all things is the flesh. Not even if the flesh itself declared that it is the most excellent, would any person bear that it should say this. But what is it, Epicurus, which pronounces this, which wrote about the end, purpose, of our being, which wrote on the nature of things, which wrote about the canon, rule of truth, which led you to wear a beard, which wrote when it was dying that it was spending the last and a happy day. Was this the flesh or the will? Then do you admit that you possess anything superior to this, the will? And are you not mad? Are you in fact so blind and deaf? What then? Does any man despise the other faculties? I hope not. Does any man say that there is no use or excellence in the speaking faculty? I hope not. That would be foolish, impious, ungrateful towards God. But a man renders to each thing its due value. For there is some use even in an ass, but not so much as in an ox. There is also use in a dog, but not so much as in a slave. There is also some use in a slave, but not so much as in citizens. There is also some use in citizens, but not so much as in magistrates. Not indeed because some things are superior, must we undervalue the use which other things have. There is a certain value in the power of speaking, but it is not so great as the power of the will. When then I speak thus, let no man think that I ask you to neglect the power of speaking, for neither do I ask you to neglect the eyes, nor the ears, nor the hands, nor the feet, nor clothing, nor shoes. But if you ask me what then is the most excellent of all things, what must I say? I cannot say the power of speaking, but the power of the will, when it is right, or for it is this which uses the other, the power of speaking and all the other faculties, both small and great. For when this faculty of the will is set right, a man who is not good becomes good, but when it fails, a man becomes bad. It is through this that we are unfortunate, that we are fortunate, that we blame one another, are pleased with one another. In a word, it is this which if we neglect it makes unhappiness, and if we carefully look after it, makes happiness. To take away the faculty of speaking and to say that there is no such faculty in reality is the act not only of an ungrateful man towards those who gave it, but also of a cowardly man, for such a person seems to me to fear, if there is any faculty of this kind, that we shall not be able to despise it.
Such also are those who say that there is no difference between beauty and ugliness. Then it would happen that a man would be affected in the same way if he saw their sights and if he saw Achilles, in the same way, if he saw Helen and any other woman. But these are foolish and clownish notions, and the notions of men who know not the nature of each thing, but are afraid, if a man shall see the difference, that he shall immediately be seized and carried off vanquished. But this is the great matter, to leave to each thing the power, faculty, which it has, and leaving to it this power to see what is the worth of the power, and to learn what is the most excellent of all things, and to pursue this always, to be diligent about this, considering all other things of secondary value compared with this. But yet, as far as we can, not neglecting all those other things. For we must take care of the eyes also, not as if they were the most excellent thing, but we must take care of them on account of the most excellent thing, because it will not be in its true natural condition. If it does not rightly use the other faculties, and prefer some things to others. What then is usually done? Men generally act as a traveler would do on his way to his own country, when he enters a good inn, and being pleased with it should remain there. Man, you have forgotten your purpose, you were not traveling to this inn, but you were passing through it. But this is a pleasant inn. And how many other inns are pleasant? And how many meadows are pleasant? Yet only for passing through. But your purpose is this, to return to your country, to relieve your kinsmen of anxiety, to discharge the duties of a citizen, to marry, to beget children, to fill the usual magistracies. For you are not come to select more pleasant places, but to live in these where you were born and of which you were made a citizen. Something of the kind takes place in the matter which we are considering. Since by the aid of speech and such communication as you receive here you must advance to perfection, and purge your will and correct the faculty which makes use of the appearances of things, and since it is necessary also for the teaching, delivery, of theorems to be affected by a certain mode of expression and with a certain variety and sharpness. Some persons captivated by these very things abide in them, one captivated by the expression, another by syllogisms, another again by sophisms, and still another by some other in, pandokiu, of the kind, and there they stay and waste away as if they were among sirens. Man, your purpose, business, was to make yourself capable of using conformably to nature the appearances presented to you, in your desires not to be frustrated, in your aversion from things not to fall into that which you would avoid, never to have no luck. As one may say, nor ever to have bad luck, to be free, not hindered, not compelled, conforming yourself to the administration of Zeus, obeying it, while well satisfied with this, blaming no one, charging no one with fault, able from your whole soul, to utter these verses. Lead me, O Zeus, and thou to destiny. Then having this purpose before you, if some little form of expression pleases you, if some theorems please you, do you abide among them and choose to dwell there? forgetting the things at home, and do you say, these things are fine? Who says that they are not fine? But only as being away home, as ends are. For what hinders you from being an unfortunate man, even if you speak like Demosthenes? And what prevents you, if you can resolve syllogisms like Chrysippus, from being wretched, from sorrowing, from envying, in a word, from being disturbed, from being unhappy? Nothing. You see then that these were ends, worth nothing, and that the purpose before you was something else. When I speak thus to some persons, they think that I am rejecting care about speaking or care about theorems. But I am not rejecting this care, 
but I am rejecting the abiding about these things incessantly and putting our hopes in them. If a man by this teaching does harm to those who listen to him, reckon me too among those who do this harm, for I am not able, when I see one thing which is most excellent and supreme, to say that another is so, in order to please you.